Okay. Thank you, Evelyn, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm coming to you here live from Israel. Uh, so hello to everyone in the world and in Florida and everywhere else. Um, so my session today will be a, a development lifecycle basics for DBAs. Um, first thing first, a few words about me. My name is Eitan Blumin. Uh, I'm a SQL Server Consultant at Madeira Data Solutions in Israel. Um, on the screen, you can see my address uh, for the blog. Uh, the blog website, uh, my email address. I also co-host the SQL Server Radio podcast together with Guy Glanzer, also from Madeira Data Solutions. You can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and all uh, other kinds of uh, social media. Um, I'm also a Microsoft uh, Data Platform MVP. Um, and that's uh, basically the essentials about me. So a few first, uh, first a few important things. Um, what is this session about and who is it for? <clears throat> so this session is uh, meant to basically introduce DBAs uh, in general and SQL Server DBAs specifically to the world of development lifecycle, which means anything that has to do with DevOps, with uh, working with source control, with uh, change automation, um, CI/CD pipelines, and agile uh, methodologies, and all of that. The world is evidently and obviously fast uh, moving towards that uh, direction. It it is basically already there, and in recent years, the database world uh, is also entered that market. And it is high time for us to, you know, to to keep up. So any DBA who is not yet there, not yet familiar with the methodologies, with the terms, uh, should familiarize themselves with these basics, these essential basics. And this is basically what they are, they are essential basics. First, we're going to learn what is database DevOps, at least in general. And then we're going to learn a few very um, important uh, core concepts. We're going to learn what is source control. We're going to learn what are unit tests, what are artifacts, uh, what are CI/CD pipelines, and very, very, very basic level, what is SSDT, which is a tool uh, in that field provided by Microsoft themselves. So let's start at the beginning. Once upon a time, uh, the classic tool set or tool belt of the uh, DBA, production DBA, uh, looked something like this. Very old, classic automobile that was basically custom built. It got you from uh, A to B, did what it had to do. Um, and whoever owned it was closely familiar with its uh, deepest inner workings. Whenever something breaks, they would know why, they could fix it. If they had to um, uh, customize something, they could do it because it was their tool set. It was their, their baby, basically. However, it is still old and outdated. It takes too much time to use and maintain this tool. And since there is so much um, human element involved, it is heavily prone to user error. And these user errors in turn also cause us to waste too much time because then we have to spend time fixing our errors, then adjusting our tool to accommodate those errors in the future and so on. And a lot, a lot of the work here is manual which is basically why it takes so much time. The main development tool of DBAs, these classic DBAs per se, would be SSMS, SQL Server Management Studio, basically writing queries, writing scripts. Uh, if we are to talk about source control, the Usually, it would be the DBA's workstation. At best, it would be some kind of central file server where they could store the set of scripts and files. 
in the worst case scenario, there would be none. There would be simply the live database, the live production database, and that would be the source control. Don't do that. If we are to talk about version history, for example, well, at best, there would be something akin to like Dropbox or something like that that would save, you know, file history just because we are saving uh, files on our drive. I saw some cases where uh, such DBAs, they do integrate with source control tools such as SVN, um, TFS, and Git, but they do it manually. They do it like essentially they treat it as a, as a file server, just drop files and scripts into it, hit commit, and then they use that as their version history. If we are to talk about unit testing, that is something that is nearly unheard of. DBAs, at least again, classic DBAs per se, um, they would then be familiar with this concept. It would be something that is not anywhere near their atmosphere of you know, uh, familiar terms and concepts that they, they, they are familiar with and they are used to work with. Um, usually it's something that is you know, left for the QA guys those folks in the QA uh, uh, room to, to deal with. If you are to talk about CICD, continuous integration and deployment, don't make me laugh, right? Because I'm the DBA, I'm the continuous integration and deployment. If we are to deploy and integrate, that is job, my job, right? That's usually the, at least the classic approach. Meanwhile, in the room next door, belong where the, all the software developers sit, their tool set, look at least compared to our classic DBA tool set, would look more like something futuristic from Star Trek or something. They have early detection, early error detection mechanisms, automated testing, automated integration, automated deployment, uh, collaborative development tools. Uh, all kinds of cool toys in the form of extensions and plugins and templates and tools and um, very useful stuff that help them streamline their development and their deployment. Usually their main development tool will be some kind of IDE, so whether it be Visual Studio or VS Code or some kind of other IDE, depending on their uh, relevant programming language. Uh, they would have source control, proper source control. They would have version history as part of that source control. They would have uh, unit testing projects. They would have continuous integration and deployment pipelines. And everything will be futuristic and streamlined and very fun to work with. I'm not here to, you know, promote and uh, the software developers and tell you to stop being a DBA, right? Uh, because it is possible for DBAs to also get there. And we're going to learn, that basically that's the, the, the idea of this presentation to help you get there because it is possible and it's very beneficial. But first, why? Why do we need DevOps for databases? Well, the database, at least nowadays in this age and era of data, data is basically our central commodity. It is our most prized um, property, most ver the highest valued item in, in our organization. All the software developer applications, all the applications and, soft and services and APIs that are developed by those uh, software developers, they are constructed around the data usually. They cannot function without the data and whatever they do, it affects the data. So this data is actually important, right? So we would want to have something as advanced as a database DevOps because it is an advancement, right? And their basic uh, core idea of this advancement is to move from a methodology of individuals to a team and to move from big and uh, infrequent deployments to smaller and frequent deployments. These two things together basically 
that's agile, right? That's agile methodology. We want to work um, more broadly as a team with better collaboration, and we want to have faster time to market. And we're going to learn a bit more about the benefits. But database DevOps is hard, and for a good reason, because we are dealing with data. And data is not something that you can just override with a click of a button when you deploy. You need to, you need to maintain that data and keep it safe so that you wouldn't lose essential uh, data during deployments whenever you change something in a database. So there are risks to database DevOps in that sense, uh, but it is still beneficial. When we are talking about CI CD or DevOps or Agile or whatever, uh, this is our end goal. This is basically how it works, right? Very, very high level, uh, the like very core concept. So we have a developer of some kind, whether it be a software developer or a DBA, like a database developer, who would uh, do their development work and save their work to some kind of source control platform. As a result of saving their work to source control, there will be automation being triggered. That automation would include automatic tests. And only when those automatic tests, they pass successfully, then we want to also have automatic deployment. And we want the important part here is, is automation because we want to eliminate the, the human element and to reduce user error as much as possible. Once we are able to do so, we can have earlier error detection. We will have less errors in production. Uh, we would have faster deployments. We would have consistent and reliable deployments. And as I said, it would be less prone to human error. Once we have those benefits, then you can, con and this is how you convince the, the higher ups, right? The management, then what would you have is faster time to market, less production failures, failures in, in production affecting end users. We would have better availability of our service because the, the less errors there are and the less failures and downtime there are, that we would have better availability. We would have less time wasted on, on the mon on needless, um, um, you know, uh, uh, needless tasks that have to be performed by humans that can be performed by automation. And as a result of all of the above, we will have less money wasted and more money earned. So, you know, the right column is what you tell your management to convince them if they are still not on board with the whole database DevOps idea. Right, so let's move on to source control, which is, as you recall, the first step. Our first step in implementing DevOps is to have source control. So let's learn a bit about that. We learn a bit about the basic terminology and the basic terms in this world of source control. And we're gonna take Git as an example because Git is, um, it is the, the, the most popular trend Although trend is a bit um, a bit a bit of a misnomer because it is a very uh, good solution compared to what it, what what came before it. Anyways, what is Git? Git is when you have a shared repository, which exists on some kind of cloud or central repository, a central server of some kind, and when a person, a developer, starts developing against that repository, first thing that they have to do is clone the repository, the shared repository, onto their workstation, their personal workstation, um, and that would be their local repository. Whenever there uh, there are commits um, coming from um, other developers coming in from the shared repository, uh, they would have to be synchronized to our local repository. So when we use something like Visual Studio, it would be working against the, our local repository. 
whenever we do uh, something that is called commit that is done against the local repository. Uh, whenever we do um, undo commit, we want to undo a commit that we perform, that would be done against the local repository. So what is a commit? A commit is a unit of work. Basically, it is a set of changes that we identify as a single unit and we give it some kind of title, some kind of summary or a message. And, and then we uh, save these changes to our local uh, Git repository. So let's say a developer uh, does their work, uh, they uh, perform all kinds of changes, and whenever they want to save those changes to their local repository, they perform a commit. At this phase, these commits are still only located, located on our local repository. So in order to synchronize those commits to the shared repository, we perform something that is called a push. We push our commits to the uh, central repository, the shared repository. And now every other developer that is also working against the same repository can pull these commits and see uh, the, uh, the same changes synchronized in their local repository. So these are the, the very, very basic concepts of cloning a repository, which is the first time you start working with, the, with, with uh, Git and committing and pushing and pulling the commit. So what is this um, central repository or shared repository that we are talking about? It is basically a branch. We are working against something that is called the branch of source control. And a branch is, we can think of it as sort of a timeline of changes, right? So let's say we have some kind of um, main branch, which is identified here in the color blue. And we want to start working on the changes against that branch. Although we don't necessarily work directly against that main branch, we first split a new branch from that main branch, which and that's this new branch would be uh, the one identified in, in uh, purple. And then we work against this uh, new purple branch. Once we are ready to save our changes and and uh, so that they would be um, um, they would be uh, also in the uh, main branch, we create some that, something that is called a pull request. A pull request is basically a request for merge. So within the confines of this pull request, there will be some kind of discussion. It is basically a code review. So you would use, you submit a request to basically uh, publish your work, if you can call it that, right? And let's say uh, the product manager or a team leader, they review your changes before they are uh, merged into the main branch. So they say, okay, this thing is okay, this thing is not okay, please fix this, please fix that. And you continue working against your branch, send new commits, they would be reflected in the pull request until the, the, your uh, uh, superior says, yeah, okay, it's approved, let's complete the pull request. And once the pull request is approved, we can perform some, something that is called the merge. And then the changes from your purple branch are merged into the main blue branch. So this slide is the very basic, very essential concept of branching in source control. Let's dive a bit deeper. So there are many um, different policies, branching policies, and different methodologies of working with branches and how, you, how do you uh, separate branches? How do you call them? How do you work with them? I found that uh, the policy, which is called Git flow, uh, is the most uh, restrictive, and at least compared to most other policies. And if you understand the concept of Git flow, you will it would find it very easy to understand the other policies because they are usually less restrictive and they are easier to understand. But the Git flow is has the like 
the very important essentials of uh, working with source control. So within Gitflow, we have several uh, core branches. We have the main branch, uh, which always is supposed to reflect what is in our production. Whatever is in the main branch, that is our production releases, right? Whatever is in the, in the develop branch, the one here identified in blue, that represents the whatever is at the version which is in development, in progress currently at the level of the repository or whatever the repository represents. It could represent the entire organization, it could represent a specific team or maybe a project. I don't know, doesn't matter. But the, this represents like the current version in development. Okay. Now, whenever a developer wants to perform some kind of change, wants to implement a feature, an enhancement, um, a bug fix, I don't know, uh, whatever it is, they do not work directly against the developer branch. They create their own feature branches, which is the purple branches we see here. And they that is the branch that is the branch that they, they work directly against. They send their push and, they push and pull their commits against that branch. Oh, right, sorry, I forgot the other branches. I apologize. Right, so um, when the current version in development is ready for uh, production, they, it would be split over into the release branch, which is identified here in the color yellow. And this release branch is supposed to uh, hold, um, you know, uh, last minute changes and fixes. And from this release branch, then it will be merged into the production branch, the main branch, sorry, uh, which then represents production. Whenever there is a, a bug in production, like it's already in production, right? And it, it is uh, important to fix it as soon as possible. Then we have something that is called the hotfix branch, which is split directly from the production branch, from the main branch. We, we use that to um, uh, implement our fixes and then merge it back to the main branch. And also merge it uh, to the develop branch so that those fixes, those, the, the, the fixes within the hotfix will be persisted in our next version, which is in development. So let me summarize again. Let's see. So the main branch must always reflect what is on the production server or environment. The develop branch reflects the current development in progress at the team or organization level, or more cor correctly to say, um, the repository, right? At the repository level, whatever the repository represents. A feature branch reflects the current development at the individual uh, developer or feature level. So I said earlier that, that uh, whenever a developer wants to implement something new, they will create a new feature branch. There are all kinds of different policies uh, in that regard. Uh, some organization demand, for example, that you will create a feature branch for each um, task. Let's say if you're using G uh, Jira or Azure DevOps, work items, so each work item or task uh, would re be represented by a separate feature branch. I saw other organizations that uh, a feature branches are in the per individual developer, so each developer would have their own personal uh, feature branch. It doesn't really matter, it depends on each uh, organization's uh, individual policies. A release branch would reflect the current pending release with possibly last minute changes or fixes. And the hotfix branch reflects emergency fixes that must be pushed to production as soon as possible. So as, as in they cannot wait until the next um, um, release that would come from the develop branch. Um, a few words about the release branch perhaps. Um, usually people ask me about it. So 
why do we have the release branch and not, for example, push directly from develop to main? So the reason for that is that, uh, let's say, let's say uh, that your organization um, has the agile methodology and it works with sprints. I'm not going to go too deep into the, what that means, uh, but let's say they work with sprints. So they say, okay, this uh, sprint ends at um, I don't know the end of uh, this week. So at the end of this week, we we stop uh, development against the develop branch. We split to the release branch, and that would uh, be represent our sprint that we completed. Meanwhile, while that release branch already exists, the development team may continue working on the next sprint. So the development branch moves on and there may be other develop, uh, developed uh, features and fixes that uh, uh, the management or production team do not want yet to see in production. So they don't want these new changes to affect what is currently in the release branch. So the release, release branch would, would exist separately from the develop branch and uh, it would um, whatever it is that needed needs to be done in order to prepare for production would be done against the release branch, uh, so it would not affect the development, the develop branch, and uh, whatever version is currently in still continued uh, um, development, and whatever is still in development would not affect what is uh, a candidate for release basically. Right, so let's uh, look at the development life cycle. The development life cycle is basically uh, the moment when a developer splits the branch from the develop branch, let's say, and uh, starts working. So as I said, if you recall, we first start with the cloning. When we first start working with with the repository that we did not yet uh, work with in our workstation, we start with clone. We want to clone the whole repository to our computer. Um, in Visual Studio, we have the uh, connections um, window. Uh, sorry, the, the solutions explorer, solution explorer window where we can manage our connections to source control. And from there, we can clone repositories to our computer. Um, once we have the repository in our computer, we can let's say split a new branch. Um, so in Visual Studio, I'll take that as an example because that's the most common. Um, at the right hand, uh, right bottom corner, we have the develop or master or main, the name of the branch that we are currently in. That's the one with the, those new uh, those branches thing. And the arrow, uh, we click on that and then we can um, either switch to another branch or create a new branch from the current branch. So if we are in develop branch, we can create a new branch for our uh, feature branch, which would use the develop branch as a, uh, like as a source or a base. So that at the moment of the split, our new uh, feature branch will be identical to the develop branch. Next, we start working, we do our changes, we commit our changes. So how do we commit changes? In Visual Studio, for example, you can find that uh, either in the changes screen in the Solution Explorer, or you click on the, the pencil icon um, at the bottom, and then you either commit your changes, or you can first uh, pick and choose which files you want to commit, uh, you want to include in your commit by staging them. Basically, a stage is, it means you you uh, tell Git, okay, I'm going to perform a commit, and these are the changes, these are the files basically that I want to put on stage and offer them for the commit. So if you do not stage any files, Visual Studio by default um, and, and each other to commit all it. Basically, what it does behind the scenes is stage all and then commit. But you can also pick and choose. And let's say you have different uh, changes and different files change and you want to 
uh, um, include each one in a separate commit or you know whatever it is however you want to group those changes together so you can pick and choose you can okay i'm going to stage file one and two and then i'm going to commit that set, write a descriptive message for that commit and after that i'm going to stage the other remaining file and write a different message for the commit um perhaps i should note that commits um, when it comes to source control, a commit is the smallest unit of uh, change that is saved in the history, in the version history. So whenever someone comes and wants to, you know, see the changes, the history of changes uh, for a given branch, for a given file or whatever, what they see is a list of commits. So it will be preferable to you know give, first of all give descriptive uh, messages or summaries to these uh, changes so that when someone sees these changes in the list in the list of commits they would know okay this one changed something uh, specific this one changed something else and so that they would they would be able to understand what was changed when at a glance Once we committed all our changes, now we are ready to push them to our shared repository. So in Visual Studio, uh, where we see that is either in the, um, uh, what's called the window, I forgot. I think it's called uh, changes or Git repository or branches in the new uh, version. Uh, either way in the, um, the bottom strip, it's represented with the, the, the upward error that's where you synchronize your changes your commits basically so you can use that and uh, push your commits uh, in the screen you also see where it shows up either it's at the bottom in the menu at the bottom or, or near the uh, outgoing um, section there you can click on push visual studio the, i mean microsoft they change it every few every once in a while so i'm certain that in a few months or so it will look completely different again uh, but the concept remains the same you make changes you commit them and then you push them so this is what you do in the first the first time you you push your changes but let's say you have more changes and you're not yet ready to uh, merge your branch. So you basically enter some kind of work cycle where you pull changes. Let's say you have um, um, more developers working against the same branch. And in order to avoid uh, conflicts, you need to first pull any changes from the, the shared repository in your branch and only then commit your changes so that Git, your local Git, uh, would be aware of any conflicts and you would be able to resolve them as needed. And then once you do that, you can push your changes again and repeat the cycle. You make changes, you pull, or you push, and this uh, combination of, um, <coughs> sorry, this combination of uh, operations of pulling and then pushing, it's also called sync in Visual Studio. And there is a separate button for that, uh, as you can see, marked at the bottom. So with a click of a button, you can just do the, the operation, the combined operation of pulling and then pushing um, your changes. And if there are any conflicts, uh, Visual Studio will let you know. Once you are done working on your feature, your work item or task, and uh, you're ready to publish your changes or um, share them with the rest of the team, you create a pull request. For example, in GitHub, um, this shows up quite uh, almost immediately uh, in the web portal. You can click on the create, um, when you have recent changes, it would just offer you to create a new pull request from those recent changes from the, the branch. Um, I saw the same thing in uh, also um, Azure DevOps, uh, in the portal, also it offers you to create a pull request when there are recent changes. Once you click that, you'll be presented with a form to fill up uh, where you can add a title, a description, 
um, you can assign um, someone who will be responsible for um, uh, working on the pull request, you can assign a reviewer or reviewers that will be responsible for approving the pull request. You can assign labels and tags uh, for your pull request. Uh, for example, you can mark your pull request with bug or enhancement or fix or whatever it is, uh, uh, whatever relevant label there is in your repository, it's possible to customize those labels. And also, if uh, if your work items or tasks are uh, stored within the same platform as the source control platform, for example, in GitHub, we have issues, GitHub issues. So you can link GitHub issues directly from pull requests using um, a special syntax. For example, in GitHub, uh, you can uh, write something, for example, uh, fix, um, pound 12 and 12 will be the number of an issue and once you do that it, the, that issue number 12 will be linked to your pull request what that would would do is that once your pull request is completed and merged successfully it could also automatically trigger the resolve like also the the closing of that relevant issue or any other issues that could be linked to it. The same functionality exists in basically every source control platform. It exists in Azure DevOps. It exists in uh, the Atlassian platform. And I imagine basically in any other that combines also uh, um, both source control and um, task management. So, we have a pull request, someone needs to review and approve it. And uh, once they do, the branch, uh, your branch, your feature branch would be merged, let's say, into the develop branch. And then it could be shared with the rest of the team. So there are all kinds of uh, source control tools and platforms that uh, you can work with. There's obviously, as I said, GitHub, there's also GitLab, there's uh, Bitbucket from Atlassian, um, Azure Repos for, as part of Azure DevOps. And there are also, uh, you know, non-Git source control uh, tools such as uh, TFS, uh, SVN, uh, SourceSafe, Visual SourceSafe, or whatever it is. That is also, those are also valid source control platforms. So, but th the important thing is, uh, truthfully, is to speak with your software developers or the product management uh, managers in your organization, ask them, which source control platform are you using today? Most likely you already are. Uh, the, your software developers in, in your organizations, they are probably already using some kind of source control platform. And the best thing would be to join them, to either join them or Let's say if they're using some kind of outdated source control platform that they anyway want to leave and, and move on to some kind of next uh, next gen uh, uh, Git platform, then fine, you will move to, to uh, the, this Git platform and then they would join you, right? And you would be the pioneer, the pioneer in, the, in this case. But whatever it is, the, the desired end result would be that both you as a DBA and the software developers in your organization would use the same platform. There is no reason to split between them. There is no reason to separate them. The functionalities are all the same and the work methodology is the same. And if you are able to collaborate with your, uh, with your peers, with your software developers, all the better. So let's learn a bit about uh, other terms. So we have unit tests. What are unit tests? So a unit test is basically the most granular and basic level of tests. It is defined per single function or method or stop procedure in our case. And they work as sort of like a state machine type tests. They receive some kind of input and every input should have some kind of expected output. It is an integral part and a very important part of the CI/CD pipeline because it has to be automated. And the purpose of it is to immediately detect any sort of breaking change. 
So for example, maybe you changed some kind of uh, stop procedure, stop procedure a while ago, a few months ago, uh, and you don't remember. But nowadays, you made a change in a table that th that procedure happens to to depend upon, and now uh, you did some kind of unexpected change. You broke your stop procedure. Not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, in in technically like it doesn't compile, but maybe it breaks something logical, some some kind of business logic. And if you had a unit test defined back then, that would uh, make sure that every uh, kind of input has the expected output, then you would be able to detect this break and change immediately. Instead of having to, you know, discover it um, retroactively when it's already too late and it's in production. Setting up unit tests is difficult. It is very time consuming and it's hard, especially, especially to design, but also to implement. But there is great benefit to it because as I said, once uh, there is some kind of break and change, you'll be able to detect it immediately because it is automated. You don't need to think about it. You just set it up once and then it's automated from that point forward and um, it will be able to uh, detect any kind of break and change, whatever you do. In Visual Studio, um, so it's a project type of uh, called MS Test and SSDT, for example, offers a new test project type uh, for databases, for SQL Server databases, that its backbone is the same MS test. So if you already have QA teams you working with MS test, uh, um, unit test for databases would still work. What is an artifact? So very basic term in a few words. So let's say you have a project and you build it. Whatever you, it is the, the result of that build. You take that and that is the artifact. That artifact is then used for deployment. You deploy that artifact to your target, let's say production, and that's it. That is an artifact. Obviously, in between more things happen, um, but the essential, this is the essential like definition of an artifact. So that when I'm, I'm telling you this so that when you hear the word artifact, you wouldn't think you know, that the, the topic of discussion is museums, right? So an artifact could be like DLL files or uh, executable files, Microsoft installer, ISPAC and DACPAC, which is relevant to our world as SQL Server DBAs. Those are artifacts because they are the result of a build of a project and they are used to deploy the project or whatever the project represents into a target, let's say production or staging or whatever. Um, I see that we are short on time. How are we on time, Evelyn? Hi. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Yes, we have, a, um, you have about 15 minutes or 16 minutes or so. so. Okay, so I'll and try to. Yeah. In a, even if you need to go five minutes over, I, I think people would appreciate the information that you're sharing. All it right. will not overlap to the next session. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so let's take an example, um, CI CD pipeline, and what does it look like? So we have some kind of trigger, and that trigger could be either scheduled or event based. So let's say we talked earlier about source control, right? So something in the source control could be the trigger to initiate the pipeline. So there is a trigger, it triggers a build. Again, this is automatic, right? So everything I'm telling you this is automatic. A trigger causes an automatic build, your project to be automatically built. There will be an artifact, obviously. And whether that build is successful or not, we would know, right? There will be some kind of log for the build, some kind of report. And um, at this point, uh, let's say, let's assume that there will be some kind of approval required before we could move on to the next phase. Um, so once we get the approval, we, we take that artifact created during the build, and then it is copied to the relevant environment. Then that artifact is deployed to that environment. Let's say there are also automatic tests that can be run 
as part of this um, pipeline. And we would also have a log output as a result of all of this process, the, deplo the, the deploy and the test, it would be visible, right? Uh, so the product manager or the team leader or, or whoever responsible will be able to see the log of uh, this uh, pipeline. And let's say we do this kind of cycle and uh, which would deploy and test uh, at a test or QA server, okay? So someone comes along and says, looks at the log and says, yeah, okay, looks okay. Move on to the next phase. So they approve it. And then um, it the same cycle initiates again, the exact same cycle as in copy, deploy and test. And uh, it would go to the staging server. Again, the same cycle. And then we'll go to the production server. And notice that those cycles of test and then staging and then production, the artifact is the same. Nowhere in this cycle, in these phases, there are changes that are done on the artifact. So the, basically it means that the version that you sent to production, you approved to be sent to production or rather to test and then to the other phases leading, leading up to production, that is the same version, right? So the idea here is that the more phases, the more cycles that the same artifact goes through, the more um, secure you are, the more certain you are, the more um, confident you are with this artifact that you created before you even reach the production phase. So that when, when it does reach the production phase, you will be confident to say, you know what? It's good. It passed enough uh, tests, enough tries, and it should work fine. If we reach this, uh, if we came this far, it should work okay in production as well. Assuming that you said all of your uh, preceding um, phases properly. So this first phase, right the the one that is responsible for uh, the trigger and the build that is uh, commonly uh, known as the ci pipeline uh, c whether uh, also known as the build pipeline or the integration pipeline that's the ci the continuous integration okay this uh, copy phase that is known as continuous delivery or cd or the delivery pipeline or Okay, so and and uh, whatever happens after the delivery, which is the deployment and the tests, that is known as the CD or continuous deployment pipeline. So the, again, the above is known as the also known as the build pipeline and the uh, uh, CD, uh, CD as in both uh, continuous delivery and deployment. This is known as the release pipelines. Let's talk a bit about triggering those pipelines. So it is a commonly um, um, practiced that by, by way of working with your source control, you also use that as your triggers for your build and release pipelines. For example, when you create a pull request, the very fact of creating the pull request or making changes to that pull request, pushing changes to the pull request, that in itself triggers the build pipeline. As in, it makes sure that those changes that you made, even before you push them to the main or develop branch rather, just to make sure it passes the very basic requirement, which is build. Just make sure that your project compiles and builds. That's the most essential requirement. Once those that pull request is completed and your changes are merged into the develop branch, that could trigger another uh, the the release pipeline of uh, that would lead up to the test or QA server, right? So once the pull request is completed, automatically the uh, the artifact created from the the last build would be sent over to the test server. Once um, changes are merged into uh, the release or changes are pushed to the, to the hotfix branches, that, let's say, uh, could trigger 
a similar release pipeline that would lead up to the staging server. A staging server is something that uh, needs to faithfully represent our production environment as much as possible without being the actual production environment. And let's say when the change is pushed into the main branch, that would uh, trigger the release pipeline that would lead up to the production server. Um, this is just an example, right? Uh, different organizations have different uh, different environments, different sets of around, different policies. So this could, you know, be different uh, between one one organization and another. But the concepts are essentially the same, right? If you understand this, you you're likely to understand every other variation that you might be uh, seeing uh, in other organizations. Right, so every this, this kind of change would in itself be a trigger. And this, those same uh, cycles would be triggered uh, over and over again. By the way, I forgot to mention, um, let's say um, that you sent some kind of, uh, you deployed some kind of version to uh, the develop branch, let's say, and it passed the tests in the test server. And then it went on to the staging server. But in the staging server, something happened. Something you, that you didn't account for. Let's say the tests failed. What you do is you do not start working on the staging server, right? You go back to your source control and you create a, a new artifact, basically. You repeat the same cycle all over again from the beginning which means um, creating a new version, creating possibly creating a new feature branch if, uh, if you deleted the previous one and repeating the same cycle. So that whatever change or fix that you are doing would have to go through the, all the phases without skipping any, any step. All the way, the build pipeline and then the test server and then the staging server and then only when a single artifact, the same artifact successfully passes all the phases without any changes in the middle, then it is safe to go to production. That's the basic idea, the, the, the essential concept of working like this. So there are all kinds of uh, popular tools for CI-CD pipelines. There's Azure pipelines, um, previously known as VSTS pipelines. There's GitHub Actions, which is relatively new. Um, there's Bamboo from Atlassian. There's GitLab. There's, there's uh, in AWS. There's also Code Pipelines and Code Deploy, which is basically the same thing um, as the Azure pipelines, build pipelines and release pipelines. We have Jenkins. We have Travis CI, Team City, Octopus Deploy, and many, many more. And again. As I said before, um, the idea here is that you need to speak with your software developers, with your de existing DevOps um, guy or gal or team or person and ask them, what is it? Which tool are you already using today? Because what we want is to collaborate. We want to exist in the same ecosystem as the software develop developers do. There is no reason to separate between software developers and DBAs because the methodologies are the same, as I said. Now a few words about SSD, <coughs> sorry, about SSDT. SSDT is a free tool available from Microsoft. It is an extension of uh, Visual Studio for Visual Studio, I'm sorry. So um, every version of Visual Studio supports it, even the free one, the community version of Visual Studio, you can use that to install SSDT. It, as I said, it is a combination of um, extensions and add-ons for Visual Studio. Uh, the main one of which is SQL Database Project, the ability to create and maintain SQL Database Projects and save them in source control. Um, within this umbrella, this uh, headline 
of uh, SSDT, SQL Server Data Tools, they, we also have the BI project, which is uh, reporting services, integration services, and analysis services. Although nowadays those are uh, have to be installed separately as separate individual extensions. But you know, as a headline, uh, they are still called they are still part of the SQL Server Data Tools ecosystem. We also, together with SSDT, we get a few very important utilities. Uh, one is the schema and data compare. We can use, uh, once we install SSDT in our Visual Studio, we can uh, perform comparisons uh, either between a, de a live database and our project, or between two live databases, or between two projects, doesn't matter. Um, and uh, whether it's the schema or the data, by the way, there is no data in project, but that's a different. That's a topic for another time. But you you, you do have these tools, right? And these tools are based on uh, technology from Redgate, so it is essentially the same thing or very similar to it. Um, so if you're familiar with those Redgate tools, SQL Compare, uh, Schema and Data Compare, it's basically the same thing, right? We also get the Refactor tool in SSDT, which can be used for very useful uh, operations, such as, for example, renaming an object or a column, uh, and then to easily propagate that change across your whole database. For example, you, you rename a column, so um, and automatically uh, each uh, every store procedure and function and foreign key uh, or and constraint and index could be automatically affected by this change, and SSDT would be would help you uh, propagate the change very easily. Or it can also be used to change a schema, to basically move an object from one schema to another. That is also possible. It has also other capabilities. Uh, it's very useful. And as I said, we also have the ability to create unit testing for SQL Server database projects. Um, the essential things to know here, which relates to uh, development lifecycle and DevOps and CICD pipelines, is that in order to build a SQL database project, we use the standard MS build command. The artifact that will be the result of that build will be DACPAC, a DACPAC file, uh, which could then be deployed using either SQL package command line utility or uh, using PowerShell using either uh, something called DAC services or DBA tools, which behind the scenes also use DAC services, but with a more friendly, user-friendly interface. Um, we also, uh, the, as I said, the unit test project, that is essentially the MS, type, MS test project type. In order to deploy that, to execute that, you, you use the standard VS test console exe. So this slide is basically what you need to give to your DevOps guy. Um, so they would know how to integrate your SSDT, your, your SQL Server project into the uh, continuous pipelines. In Azure DevOps, for example, there are in, in already integrated built-in tasks that do this for you. So if you happen to use Azure DevOps, it is very easy to set up pipelines for your SQL database project. Speaking of which, um, I strongly recommend uh, a few um, very useful resources. There is the introduction to GitHub for DBAs, a session by Brent Ozer available on YouTube. There is also the Azure DevOps Duet uh, by Kevin and Understad. Uh, they they, they uh, deliver this uh, session in various versions across different uh, events and, uh, and uh, user groups. Um, Sanderstad specifically in his GitHub repository has a set of uh, templates and starter scripts that can be used um, to uh, integrate uh, um, SSDT and unit tests uh, into continuous pipelines. I strongly recommend uh, a session by Alex Yates called Zero Downtime Database Deployments. It doesn't speak specifically about a certain technology, it, it is more, um, it's more high level than that. 
uh, in it talks about the development and deployment methodologies that can be used for zero downtime, actual zero downtime, um, it, which is can be very useful for you know critical systems that need to be uh, um, 24 7 online uh, and uh, cannot suffer any downtime cannot suffer any failures so very useful uh, session i strongly recommend it and you can also find resources at microsoft docs uh, on ssdt and how to work with it uh, and sql package and everything related to that Whew, that was a lot of stuff any questions now is the time. 